Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson Chapter 3 The last verberations of sound hung in the air and jangled in Chris's head. Of the many times he had examined Mr. Wicker's window and poured over the rope, the ship, and the Nubian boy, he had never gone into Mr. Wicker's shop. So now, alone until someone should answer the bell, he looked eagerly, if uneasily, around him. What was with the one window in the lowering day outside? The low, narrow shop was somber. The ceiling seemed close above Chris's head. High, hand-tuned beams crossed it from one side to the other. A few dusty pieces of furniture stood about, whether for sale or use, Chris could not determine. And almost lost in the black shadows at the far end were what appeared to be boxes and bales piled one upon the other. The growing silence, now the bell had stopped, gripped Chris. A chill made itself felt in his feet and spread rapidly over his body so that he gave a convulsive shiver. He was about to turn and go out when, at the farthest end of the gloomy shop, a small primrose oblong of light seeped for a little way along the floor, and a door opened. Fascinated, Chris stared as into the distant distant pallor stepped the short and remarkably spidery figure of a man. Mr. Wicker's back being toward the source of light, Chris could not see his face. The figure paused, with a fragile hand scarcely bigger than that of a child's on the door handle, and then came forward. The silence, Chris noted, was still unbroken as Mr. Wicker advanced toward him, and Chris shuddered again as he stood waiting and watching, but whether it was with cold or with fear, and the room was indeed very dank and unaired, it would have been hard to say. When Mr. Wicker had come within a few feet of Chris, the final vestiges of daylight from outside reached the extraordinary man facing the boy, and for the first time Chris was able to examine the old man, who was more legend than fact, throughout Georgetown. William Wicker's face in itself was not forbidding. What made an icy mouth seem to run the length of his spine was the impression of immense age and the appearance of the man confronting him. The thin lips crackled, the withered and multi-withered cheeks and the ghost of what had once been a smile. The nose, once hawk-like and proud and denoting strength of character and purpose, was now pinched by the ever-tightening fingers of a progression of years. The double fans of minute wrinkles, breaking from eye and corner to temple and joining with those over the cheekbones, were drawn into the horizontal lines across the domed forehead. Little tufts of white fuzz above the ears were all that remained of the antiquarian's hair, but what drew and held Chris's gaze were the old man's eyes. Mr. Wicker's eyes were not those of an old man at all. They had the vigor of a man in the prime of life, and their presence in that puckered face of age which confronted Chris was horribly disconcerting. Chris blinked and looked again. Yes, they were still there. Eyes so deeply brown they might well have been black, but clear, sparkling, with a decided glint of humor and mischief. While the boy had been too frightened to move at the sight of Mr. Wicker's ancient cheeks, pinched nose, and hairless head, he was encouraged by the friendly eyes. Chris could not help but like those eyes, even though it was hard to believe that they belonged to the man before him. As though from a great distance Mr. Wicker's voice came to his ears, and this too, Chris came to bone difficult to credit. There, not four feet in front of him, was the old shopkeeper, and yet a high, thin voice might have come from anywhere else. The rafters? The roof uh, um, above the lighted door? Anywhere. Well, my boy. You wanted something? Miss swallowed, and his voice came back to him. Yes, sir, he said. I saw your sign, and I know a boy who needs the job. He looked at Mr. Wicker as though he was unable to look out elsewhere. He's a schoolmate of mine. Jackie Harris, his name is, and he really needs the job. I wondered, Mr. Wicker's eyes, slapping at him just a little, confused Chris, and he began to stammer. I, I just wondered if the places was still open. Mr. Wicker studied Chris for a moment or two before he replied. What he saw was a fresh-cheeked lad, tall for thirteen, sturdy, with sincerity and good humor in his face and something sensitive and appealing about his eyes. His chin showed obstinance and tenacity. His nose would shape itself well as he grew older. Unruly, tawny hair was blown and ruffled in every direction, and his hands, even young as he was, showed ability and strength. Mm -hmm.
said Mr. Wicker, and his remote smile broadened while his eyes sparkled with the warmth of a fire on a winter's night. Mm, yes, the job is still open, young man. But while you're still here, why not apply for it yourself? Chris, somewhat ill at less ill at ease, now he had got his message out, shifted his feet and gave a short laugh. <laughs> oh, 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 no, no, thank you, sir. You see, I don't really need it, and Jakey does. It wouldn't be fair for me to take it if Jakey has a chance. He looked away and saw that the light from the distant hidden room was jumping and flickering on the shadowed walls. Guess there must be a lively fire in that room beyond. Of course, he said anxiously, I don't know what the job is. You don't say on the sign, and Jackie is an awfully ill. He has a twisted foot and makes him slow in walking. Would that interfere with Jackie's getting the job, sir? Chris inquired. The reply was slow in coming, and Chris heard as if the words had been spoken, not before him, where the black outlined figure still stood, but as if it at his very ear, soft but clear, the words sounded. It would not interfere, Christopher, my boy. And now that you are here, you must take the test. Jakey will be cared for. Never fear. Almost as if in a dream, Griff felt an atmosphere drenching him as though a powerful scent filled the air. His head swam a little, and he realized that it was a long time since he had had lunch. He thought he detected a pleasant smell of herbs, like the potpourri his mother had in bowls in their house. A sharp black outline of Mr. Wicker impressed itself on his eyeballs. And in the room, now totally dark except for the light that streamed from the faraway open door, Mr. Wicker's body seemed to radiate a bright edge like a carbon paper held up to the sun. The voice in his ear once more filled his head and his hearing. You will take the test, my boy. Now. Miss turn around and tell me what you see out my window. Chris, in spite of the strangest rising above him like mist, remembered very well what lay outside the window. But even as he slowly turned, the thought pierced his mind. Why had he not seen the reflection of the headlights of the cars moving up around the corner of Water Street and up the hill toward the traffic signs? And why had the sound of wheels, of gears, and of horns been so completely muffled out? The room seemed overly still. Then, in that second, he turned and faced about. The wide bow window was there before him, the three objects he liked best showing frosty in the moonlight that poured in from across the water. Across the water? Where was the freeway? It was no longer there, nor were the high walls and smokestacks of factories to be seen. The warehouses were still there. They were the very same, for Chris could make out the winch and tackle he had noticed as he opened the door. But instead of factories... Instead of the freeway, the river flickered silver under the moon, and the stills and mass of cutlass ships broke the starry sky. Flabbergasted and breathless, Chris was unaware that he had moved closer to peer out the window in every direction. No electric lights, no lamplit streets, going as far as the wall to his left and leaning forward. Chris looked up towards M Street, where the people's drugstore had stood but half an hour before rose the roofs of what was evidently an inn. A courtyard was sparsely lit by a flaring torch or two, showing a swinging sign hung on a post. The post was planted at the edge of what was now a broad and muddy road. Even as Chris stared, not knowing whether to believe what his eyes saw or not, there was a great sound of hooves and of a cracking whip. A coach with its top piled high with luggage stamped to a halt beside the flagged courtyard. Ostlers ran out to hold a team of horses steaming in the cool night air, and link boys carrying torches and orange lanterns ran out to help the travelers in. The coachman wore knee breeches and a cockaded hat. Two gentlemen got down from the interior of the coach, stretching their cramped legs. This could catch the shine as lantern glow touched the silver buckles on their shoes. Their full-back coats were slightly lifted on the left by the tips of their rapiers, and a froth of white lace or muslin fell from their necks onto satin waistcoats. They moved into the inn. The coach rattled off to the stable. Before the windows, farm carts rumbled by, and instead of the crowded outline of Georgetown roofs, it's good to see only a few chimneys against the star and many lofty bodies. What do you see, my boy? asked the voice of a gentle as his ear. Chris, frightened and downfounded, shook his head. I will tell you, Mr. Wicker said. My window has a power for those few who are to see. You are looking back into the past, my boy. The way it used to be. 
Then the coldness, the strangeness, the fluttering of the light was too much for Chris. Blackness descended on him as if a hood had been dropped over his head. Before he was quite gone, he heard what he thought was Mr. Wicker's voice saying kindly, You will do. Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson, Chapter 3.